Hello everyone and welcome once again to Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and doing well out there in these very difficult times. Today I want to talk to you about something called naive Bayesian reasoning, which is a sort of a bridge between the world of probabilistic reasoning that we've talked about previously and the world of machine learning that we're about to talk about. Naive Bayesian reasoning is essentially a machine learning technique, but a semi-principled probabilistic machine learning technique. And as such, I think it's a pretty interesting thing to think about. So what do I mean when I say something's a form of machine learning? Well, we'll be talking about that in future lectures, but the short version is that a machine learner looks at a collection of data, tries to gather statistics about that data to try to understand what its underlying structure is, and then uses that to try to predict a classification for new data instances. So we have a bunch of evidence for and against a thing from past cases, and we knew whether that thing was true or false at the end of the day then we can use that information about how past cases worked out to decide whether we think this thing is true or false. So it's super classic probability. The, this is Bayes' rule that we had before says what we want to do is we want to get the probability of the hypothesis given all these, you know, the hypothesis here being, let's say, an email message is spam, is a bad email message, as opposed to ham, a good email message, then we'll say that the probability that it's uh, of the hypothesis, in this case that it's uh, spam, given these pieces of evidence, right, is some amount. And the evidence here might be that it contains keywords for a spam message that are spammy words. It might be that it contains funny features that spam messages often have, like all uppercase. Uh, whatever, the, whatever the reasoning is, we have a bunch of pieces of evidence. And for the sake of argument today, we're going to say that our hypothesis is Boolean like this. It's either spam or not spam. And the evidence or is also Boolean. The message either contains or doesn't contain money. And the problem here is that this thing, this all these commas here are essentially a conjunction. This is the probability that the hypothesis is true that given that these things are all together at the same time. What are the odds we've ever seen an email message exactly like this before that we classified? Pretty low, right? So we don't really have enough information to decide the hypothesis based on this conjunction. What we're going to do is a very naive thing. It's the thing that makes this naive phase. We're going to proceed in steps first of all. We're first going to take the Bayes' rule and use it to turn it around. This is the probability of the various pieces of evidence given that the hypothesis is true divided by the probability that the pieces of evidence all occur together. But again, we don't really get these we don't have enough data typically to do this. There's a huge space of values, so there's no way that we're ever gonna get enough examples. So let me show you a data set that I've been working with for a long time. I collected a lot of it myself. This is a whole bunch of my personal emails, about 15,000 of them that I manually classified into either ham or spam. So this is an instance identifier this is the class, in this case spam, in this case ham, and these other things are various features that are indicative features of whether the message is spam or not. Some of them may be true when a message is ham, some of them may be true when a message is spam, but they're all good words for indicating the difference between the two, or good features for indicating the difference between the two. So the problem is there's 150 some of these features that means that I'm never going to find any messages that match exactly. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little bit of an approximation. Uh, first of all, we binarize, so that's one thing. Then we're just going to assume that all these messages are independent. That is, the probability that the evidence, that piece of evidence one comes out positive given the hypothesis is completely independent of whether E2 comes out positive given the hypothesis. Now we know that's not true. You know, this is not 
a reasonable thing. There's no conditional independence here. But if we assume that there is, then we can replace that fancy internal conjunction with a plain old multiplication. And these numbers, we know how to compute all of these numbers. Now, let's talk at some point about how we do compute all those numbers, right? We're going to be doing counting. So we ask if we want to know what the probability is that feature one is true, given that the message is spam, then um, we can go through, filter out all the messages, all the, all the instances for which the message is in fact spam, right? for where it's one, where the classification is one, we can look at piece of evidence one and count the number of those spam messages where the thing is, where that feature is present. And remember, probability is just a division thing. So if I do all that counting, um, then the probability of uh, being spam given um, feature uh, zero equals one equals the number of messages which are um, both which have both right um, sorry it's the other way around that has feature one given that it's spam is we take all the spam message um, and we divide that by the total number of spam messages, right? And so those are just two simple counts. We can do those counts no problem by just counting up in the data. And now we have one of these probability terms and when we've done that, when we've got the probability term the way we want it, then we do it again for the other messages. And so that's where all these terms are coming from in this product. What's this? This is the probability that a message is spam. Well, we have that count. That's easy enough to do. And these are um, just the probabilities that the features are true at all, right? Now, the problem is that since we're doing naive Bayesian reasoning, the probabilities will be too low because the strengthening, you know, will underestimate a little bit because the because when terms interact, that can make it more likely that the message is spam. So, but what we're gonna say is that, well, that kind of error is gonna be pretty similar in the true case or the false case. So if we have a new message now, and we want to decide whether it's spam or ham, we compute this as above, you know, using this fancy thing. Then we compute it again for the other way around. What's the probability that it is uh, ham given that it's, uh, given that it has all these features. And then we just compare those two probabilities and whichever one's larger we take as the thing. Now, note that those probabilities should add up to one, but they're actually going to add up to a number less than one, but that's okay. We still are going to take the more likely hypothesis, which is to say the bigger probability. Notice that because we're doing this comparison like this, the denominator for both things is the same. It's just the evidence. And so we can actually get rid of the denominator, which is nice. It simplifies everything a lot. So I only have to compute these numerators, right? Um, I, I compute these prob probabilities of the individual pieces of evidence given H. I compute the probabilities given not H. Uh, I multiply by the probability of H here. I multiply by the probability of not H over there, uh, which is one minus H. And when I've got that, then probability of H. And that simple counting is all I need to do what I wanna do. But wait, there's still more problems. <sighs> Imagine I do some counting and one of these terms are, is zero or one. Well, sorry, zero. Um, then in that situation, it doesn't matter what the other terms are. 
this term will dominate and say that you know we don't have any instances that where e2 is true given age well does that mean there aren't any oh probably not what it probably means is that we've you know just haven't measured enough instances to find one yet so what we're going to do is take the assumption that well maybe there's half an instance uh Yeah, we may just not have any instances at all that have e1 equals v1, and so then this whole denominator is not well-founded. But what we assume is that sort of on average, we probably missed, we haven't just haven't got a large enough sample to see very small effects. And so what we're going to do is just arbitrarily assume that there's half a sample if we sampled twice as many we'd find one of these and so what we're going to do is just add one half to the probability in this thing right this is the same sum i wrote on the terminal a minute ago but with this funny plus one half term added into it in both the numerator and the denominator and when i do that first of all it gets rid of those zeros which is great but second of all, it may actually make the calculation be more accurate because it really is true probably that that thing wasn't actually zero. So that's a trick we use, M estimation. Finally, what we've got here is the product of a whole bunch of small numbers, right? The probability of any piece of evidence given the hypothesis is gonna be less than one and sometimes a lot less than one. And so I said I had 500 features here. If I say, well, what's 0. Um, even 0. 0.5 to the um, 500 features or whatever it is, um, is there really that many? No, there can't be. 80 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, yeah, about 500 features. 0 0.5 to the 500th, well, that's a pretty small number. In fact, it's such a small number that it might underflow the uh, uh, single precision floating point number, right? That's a number small enough to make multiplication be a little bit sketchy here, even given floating point, which is weird. But of course, the way that you traditionally work around that problem is you use logarithms. Uh, so what we're gonna do is take the logarithm on both sides, which should still preserve the inequality, right? We're just comparing to see which is greater than which. And so when we take logarithms on both sides, we turn these things into a sum because logarithms turn products into sums. So now I've got, um, <clears throat> Let's see. Now my number comes out to be some number that's about five, which I can kind of um, I can kind of uh, deal with that, right? And so if the other one was, um, you know, everything was coming out 0 0.4 on the average, then sure enough, um, that number would be smaller, and I would choose the first thing over the second thing. So that's just a little numeric trick. You don't always do it because modern double precision floating point numbers are crazily large, but it's a trick you can use if you're starting to have overflow issues with your floating point numbers. Uh, the other thing is you can have underflow issues if the probabilities are small, and so that's another thing, yeah. So, well, I guess it's underflow always, yeah. So that's naive Bayesian reasoning, and uh, it, is straightforward to take this data that I have and work through a whole example, and I'll do that for you at some point, but that's the basic idea here, is that we're gonna use our notion of Bayes' rule and probability, and we're gonna use it on an existing data set like this, and then when we get a new message in, we use this reasoning with the features of the new message to try to classify it as either ham or spam. And that turns out to be a really pretty good spam filter you can find a paper on my psu website in my bibliography where i and some of our students uh did a bunch of spam filtering studies and naive bayesian did pretty well especially for such a simple method one of the nice things about naive bayes is that it's very transparent you understand why it's computing the results it's computing and 
another nice thing about it is it's very simple to implement so yeah that's naive bayesian reasoning as always i hope this was helpful as always i really hope you'll continue to do well and stay safe and thank you very much for listening i look forward to talking to you again soon